Hello, welcome to the second EBL Q&A. Sorry for the delay there. We were fixing the tech issues so that we don't have the same problems as last time, but we're glad you're all here. That being said, we have our new friend, who's an old friend, but now he's a new friend, Nils Wagner, and he will be the fourth co-host. And he'll be on about every three or four weeks with me, Josh, and Jefferson. So Nils, why don't you go ahead and quickly introduce yourself before we jump into this Q&A. Funnily enough, I think I've uh, done this on your live stream as well as on uh, Josh's. But uh, yeah, here we go again. Hi, audience. Um, I'm Nils Wegner. I, uh, yeah, I'm working with Tyler on the Radix relaunch and uh, have done some live streaming about Carl Schmidt. Uh, preferably, which is funny enough because just today is the uh, 132nd birthday of Carl Schmidt. So it's pretty nice that we have all gathered again uh, around our little uh, fashy campfire to discuss uh, political and philosophical stuff. Uh, I have actually started, uh, I actually did start studying medicine myself, but dropped out after three terms and uh, switched over to history and uh, political sciences and eventually graduated in uh, 2014 with a master's degree and have uh, been working for uh, dissident publishers like uh, Antaios, the, the biggest, um, let's say uh, hard right conservative uh, publisher in the German speaking world right now and uh, have done some uh, translational work on people like uh, Richard Spencer, Jack Donovan, Camille Paglia and uh, recently some uh, guy that may be a little controversial in these uh, circles, but uh, is in this case uh, actually worth the read. And I've translated uh, Martin van Krefeld's um, hypothetical Hitler autobiography, Hitler and Hell, into German von Austrian publishing house. So that's what I do for a living. And besides that, uh, I, I try to network internationally. That's uh, how I got invited to uh, help with the Radix and NPI relaunch. And here we are doing uh, the intellectual work and uh, answering questions about ontology as well as about uh, hopefully more uh, interesting everyday stuff like uh, black metal music and uh, the type of booze that is uh that is uh preferable if you're a fashion right wing and stuff like that yeah well really happy to glad have you on board and you know we would have to do an ebm sometime euro bureau of metal and debate josh and jefferson on panther i think that'd be very good speaking of jefferson by the way he is still currently under the weather so he'll be back for our next episode on michelle foucault's birth of biopolitics and we'll be joined by alex McNabb some other quick house cleaning. Make sure to go subscribe to Radix on Library because that's where we're moving a lot of this stuff now. And Expanser Group will be back tomorrow. So now that that's out of the way, let's get started um, on the questions. Someone asked, I said I should be smoking a cigar. I would be smoking a cigar if I wasn't inside right now, but we'll have to save that for when I move the setup next time. So I guess I'm wearing the moderator hat for this stream. So I guess I'll start right away with the First question, and I'll throw it to Nils first, and then Josh, and then myself. So this one comes from Insane Hermit on Ko-Fi. He says, maybe off topic, but what makes you guys think that the right race, white race is not headed for another holodomor? Oh, well, I've heard about some uh, some guy uh, that has gained some, some recent uh, milieu prominence on Twitter, uh, who seems to be really prolific and a real pro about Holodomor questions. And uh, maybe we should ask him. But uh, to be honest, I, I suppose most of our audience know what the Holodomor is, the uh, extermination of the, of the uh, larger farmer class, the Kulaks, uh, in the Ukraine by uh, 
by deliberately starving them through uh, grain confiscations by the uh, Soviet military. Well, um, I guess it has uh, been brought on as a topic uh, quite a few times that uh, we are seeing uh, stuff. Uh, I mean, it's 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 always quite ironic when people talk about the Internet of Things and how all this ties in with the uh, with the big tech and 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 woke uh, capital vendetta against dissident thinking. So uh, I, I, I uh, if I recall right, the the usual. Uh, joke that's made is maybe one day we'll all have a smart fridge that uh, will order the food that you need itself when uh, when when the fridge is, is getting empty and sooner or later as it is all already connected with your uh, Amazon Echo and stuff like that uh, it will just say well uh, I heard you made a racist joke uh, like three weeks ago so uh, no more meat for you. And uh, of course, Amazon and all the other woke uh, companies will work into that. So that might actually be uh, some uh, something we might see in the future if all this uh, stuff goes on. Like it's, <laughs> you could call it food cancel culture, if you will. But uh, looking at this as some sort of governmental program, I don't really think that this is this is a prospect for the white race because um, as of now, um, whites are still needed to work in the the middle on, on the middle levels of, of uh, even the biggest globalist industry and not all positions uh, can be filled with cheap labor from from Africa or uh india or what have you so um trying not to sound too uh socially darwinist here but um yeah um as for now the the white race uh is too uh, too precious a human resource in the true sense of the word to be uh killed off like livestock so um yeah taking uh Taking this question at face value, I don't believe that uh, some new Holodomor is upon us. I think that's a good answer. Uh, Josh, what do you think? Well, I have live stream PTSD, so frankly, I'm afraid to uh, say anything too lengthy around uh, at the risk that this whole channel just lapses into itself. So why don't you just give me a test and let me know that that went through fine. I can hear you fine. All right. Well, uh, there was an interesting story. I think page six of the New York Post recently, uh, retired hedge fund manager uh, John Paulson recently made some statements about uh, Spence, uh, which is a private or elite uh, school in Manhattan talking about how he was very concerned about the kind of indoctrination uh, or the the uh, the anti-white indoctrination I think was the exact quote uh, in the in the paper so I was talking to Jefferson about this the other day I think it's a case where a lot of powerful moneyed socially connected white people um, are kind of oblivious to some degree, especially the older generation, to what's going on and the reality of the social progress, the um, legal changes, cultural changes over the last half century have not quite migrated up to the most connected and powerful people. Or, I mean, not like the very top, but like the rung or two below, like the, the actual shakers and movers. Um, so in a sense of optimism perhaps you know i don't think um people are aware of really the extent of what's going on uh so i'm, I'm not really concerned about some kind of international genocide or extinction level event which will uniquely remove uh ethnic europeans from the planet uh, i think that's a little bit of a paranoid right-wing fantasy 
um, and not just from from kind of the materialist perspective that Nils provided, although I, that that's clearly evident. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think we're going anywhere. I mean, historically, who are the kinds of people who have sadly exited the evolutionary game uh i don't mean this in a in a in a cruel way but like you know quote unquote primitive types you look at the amerindians of the north american continent they're not gone completely um they're a non-force uh politically culturally um we're we are like like um like the orients like the Oriental people, like the Semitic people, we are kind of significant cultural, technological, we're a significant force. Uh, I'm not concerned about us going anywhere. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I mean, in my, like, I don't think it'd be an engineered campaign like in this Soviet case, right? And I think largely it's probably keeping us for the value of our labor, right? and the debt that we provide for the debt economy. But my worry is more so along the lines of the fact that when you take a look at the overall trajectory of public opinion about whites, is it's basically, you know, whites are innately racist. There's nothing you can do about it. They're always gonna be racist. And then the whole thing is you need to remove them out of these certain positions so that they can't perpetuate white supremacy. So it wouldn't be like an engineered kind of state thing like the Soviets, but I think the level of violence, even though the attack on whites, I think it's going to be primarily institutional. And that would lead, of course, to greater and greater deaths of despair and suicide and things of the like, because you're removing us outside of our position. So we have no influence or no ability to, you know, raise families or to move yourself up the ladder. You know, the, the whole middle class seems to basically be disappearing. Right. And so I think it's going to be a slower descent into into this kind of despair that we're already just beginning to inhabit. Now, I think the difference with the Amer Indians is that, you know, they, they're they not, the reason they're, they're in the position they are was because, you know, at least in the American case, was losing a conflict. But it's not the same thing where it's, you know, their own leader saying you have to put aside Indian privilege and stop perpetuating Indian supremacy rights. So I, I think the difference is, is ours is more of an inward turning that's justifying our own removal of ourselves to ourselves. And it's also justifying uh, attacks on us from the outside. And it's giving like, you know, minorities who won't say minorities, the idea that the reason that they are the way they are is because of us. And that will justify in their mind more attacks on us. So I think economically and physically violence on whites is going to get worse, but just not as a state engineered kind of solution, uh, sorry, state engineered program right at least in the terms of a physical genocide right but i mean it's state engineered it's still going to be state engineered when it comes to removing us out of positions um all right well before you just jump to the next question i mean it, it this is where kind of like a marxist or class reductionist um perspective helps a little bit life has kind of always been precarious for for the underclass uh and the middle class seems to be disappearing as quickly as it emerged you know um i i'm not a historian people can challenge that claim but i mean like in the contemporary way in which we think about these these social classes uh life has always been kind of difficult ed dutton pointed this out many many months ago that uh studies of of the the trajectory of the british empire showed that the empire was a, a net negative for the underclasses you know, so there, there's something to to consider um, that we're kind of we're going to bear the brunt of whatever changes are going to take place over the next century, uh, and it's our class. Everyone who's not a protected class uh, owns land. Uh, is financially self-sufficient or relatively self-sufficient. It's always those people who are going to have to, us, frankly, <laughs> who are going to have to deal with with the the slings and arrows of, of uh, cruel misfortune. So, yeah. Yeah, good point. All right, uh, next question. This one's from Anon for five, and this one's aimed at me, so I'll take this one right away. 
It is. Sam, can you explain the postmodern concept of sign and image distinction? You referred to it in one of the ECL episodes. All right. So basically, it's a distinction that's aiming to understand like the speculative dimension of aesthetic experience. So if you look at the word symbol, it's a it's a Greek comes from a Greek word actually as a token of remembrance, and it could be broken into two, so that a uh, descendant of a former guest at the end of their house, the co-joined pieces would kindle into an act of recognition. So that's where we get our word symbol from. And so the symbol symbol connotates what we recognize. It's it connotates explicitly what we recognize uh, implicitly, right? So it's associated with a promise of completeness. So it, it would basically mean then the symbol is associated with notions of repetition and also hope for an abundance of meaning that you get from gazing at a symbol. So it's connected to the speculative dimension, right? So then the sign's proper function. So if you look at a sign, right, what does a sign do distinct from a symbol? A sign refers to a referent. A sign is self-canceling. So a good road sign, for example, is not a sign that points to itself so you're driving on the road and it's just like oh wow look at this beautiful sign that has the rainbows on it and sparkles and then you get into a car accident because you're paying attention to the sign a good sign is something that points away from itself it points to a reference right well the symbol does not refer outside of itself it presents its own meaning so then that meaning becomes present in the symbol so it has a speculative capacity like a certain presenting unstated meanings that when you look at an image or say a link, uh, word, for example, there's a given expression, but the meaning is not completely captured or overwhelmingly given in it, right? So what, what this is trying to do is point to, and you can look at this as for like religious cases of like an icon versus an idol, is that the speculative power of an image is, is effectively like finding the sublime dimension where unstated meanings are never they're present to you and the fact that they're presenting a sort of reality that you're inhabiting, but um, it's never fully grasped or conceptualized. So an artwork, if you're looking at an artwork, for example, it could always mean more because the transcendent realm of meaning is always implicit in it, but always pointing beyond it, right? So you could use that for language too, like language always has a certain infinity or divinity behind it. And the fact that it's trying to refer to objects in the world but there's an overwhelming givenness and the sign can't capture all of it, right? The linguistic sign, not sign in terms of like road signs that I was making that distinguishing between earlier. So that would be the, the main uh, conception and di conceptual difference between the symbolic and the sign, or you could say the idol and the icon. And it's effectively making a phenomenological case as to why um, certain how we interpret the world and how like say for example the religious significance of the symbol or you could say like looking at the fascist symbol right why they have an effect on us as they do it's because they point to a meaning that promise for, promises fulfillment but that fulfillment never actually arrives it's never fully present but you rather you dwell in that so that would be my uh that would be my brief discussion of that anyways um all right next one from my friend norpain he actually doesn't ask. If, I, if I just may, if I just may try, may try to sum that up in, in one single sentence. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You're the philosopher here. Um, the sign points to something, whereas the symbol is a stand-in for something that could not be expressed in a in a in an easy way, in a uh, non-complicated way, by mere words. Yeah, and that's the condition of the sublime, right? So you're you're dwelling in it, right? So it's like you look at the fascists, for example. I mean, we're not all bounded together and strong right now. But when you're looking at the symbol and you're put, orienting people around this shared symbol, right, it start, helps to create that reality into being because it's pointing towards a future that's not quite there yet. So it's it explains aesthetic experience, but it also explains like, political organization and religious significance or like the Eucharist, right? So it's interesting. Uh, did you, anyone guys want to comment on that or should I get to the next question? All right, next question. So this one's from uh, my friend Norpain. He, uh, he actually just donated $73 and said, for uniforms as discussed, which I think he means you should all 
the on the cowboy hat and the the Berta the Berta suit, right? And uh, says, "Keep up the good fight, bud." All right, thank you. The next question is actually aimed specifically at Jefferson, so I'll just save that one till he's back with us. All right, so I'm happy mask salesman for three. Is neo-absolutism incompatible with moral universalism? Is there a way to reconcile it with a long-term desire for international peace and some form of human rights? Who wants to take that one first? Well, it's a shame Joel's not here to answer that question. <laughs> I don't know that I have anything to say. I mean, the question is asking is neo absolutism incompatible with universalism? Yeah. That's what the question is asking. Yeah. Uh, my layman's stab at the question would be no, right? I mean, what is absolutism other than we're saying we're imposing some central uniform power over? whatever terrain we're talking about so wouldn't universalist a moral universalism uh follow from a neo-absolutist center i tend to agree do you want to try and chime in there nels before i tackle it mm, i would just guess the same because uh assuming that another way of life and another political system is possible is damaging and weakening to any real absolutism so uh, absolutism in and of itself has to have a a universal uh approach and the demand for universal power uh, be it in a in a direct and aggressive or in a sublime and 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 uh encroaching way so that's that's just uh, what what my thoughts on this are. I completely agree with Josh on this. Right. Yeah. I, see, I, I tend to think about like I know one person in the chat saying it's it's a false dichotomy. Now I, I do tend to agree with this as well. And this is something that you see when it comes to discussions of like, you know, if you're having a fascist state, should you adopt a moral universal universality, or is that somehow um, inconsistent with it? And I guess you would apply the same question to new absolutism. I don't think it is. I mean, first of all, in one sense, if, if you're making the position that, you know, fascism or neo absolutism or whatever is the ideal form of government that we need, you're essentially making that case for the whole world. You're saying this would be the ideal form of government, right? You're making a case that's universally and logically binding to be the best possible political system you could have. And so when it comes to the practical concerns, I mean, there's nothing wrong with empathy or you know, um, ideas of more univer uh, universal moral good, right? There's no reason, like Mosley said, that once you have a European Imperium, you could use surplus to try to help other nations, right? There's no reason, there's no, there's no reason that you can um, adopt a moralistic stance geopolitically, right? And the other thing that goes into that, of course, is even if you're someone who believes in the idea of, you know, nationalism means you should just completely withdraw from the world and you should have you know, no, no intervention, you should be totally isolationist. And so any universalism is completely incompatible. The argument falls over the fact that when you're making that claim, you're basically saying there needs to be a universal order of nation states that's going to uphold that for the whole world. Well, once you get into that question, and then you actually get down to the nitty gritty of it. No one just adopts this mass uh, enlightenment area that everyone should have that moral right to their nation and then so you get into the very real political questions of enforcing that and power and who's going to set the tone for that right so i would agree it's a false dichotomy and nails looks like you want to chime in there uh, yeah i just uh, just uh, wanted to point out that the same problem the same problem of universalism that uh is actually necessary for an anti for a for an uh anti universalist system in name only to uh to be able to exist uh, it's the same thing with uh ethno pluralism which uh i've uh i've started to call a mere meme because it is always pointed out as an anti universalist order but needs universalism to function because 
in an ethno-pluralist system where you say that every ethnicity or every race um, has its own homeland or should have its own homeland and live there exclusively. Um, you need a, a, a universal, a worldwide, a global order uh, that follows this system because everything falls apart, everything breaks down uh, at the moment one race, one people, one ethnicity does not follow these rules anymore. And uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much what uh, all those proponents of ethnopluralism tend not to think about when they put it as a bulwark against American or uh, back in the day before 1990 against Soviet uh, imperialism and, and uh, universalist approaches. Um, yeah, if, if you want to be left alone, you need everyone else to leave you alone and there needs to be some framework to enforce that. And that is, of course, in and of itself, universalism. Right. All right, should we move to the next question? I'll take that to yes. All right, the next question is concerning what is our position on the racial question, racial question from within a third position standpoint. How do we view race in third positionism and where does race fit into our worldview in this? Do you want to take that first, Josh? Uh, yeah, this is a tricky one. Um, I was thinking about this earlier because you shared it with us before we went live and I was trying to think of the, the perfect response. Of course, I didn't get, I didn't produce one, so I'll do the best that I can here. Um, to kind of build off of something I was saying in the previous stream, you know, you could say maybe psychologically that the function of something like the alt-right uh, or white nationalism or whatever has been to reintroduce racial and ethnic identity or racial identic, uh, ethnic uh, identification thought to people who have had it stripped from them by capitalism, American neoliberalism. Um, it's important to, I think, get back in touch with authentic modes of being things that are closer to you, uh, that have a, a future orientation, um, that are not fragile and can be easily deconstructed or broken down or, or discarded. But insofar as the role race should play in third position, um, I think we're fighting for bigger things than just racial identity. Um, I think it's integral I need, you know, an Irish person will, will need to think of themselves as Irish or as a Celt or Gaelic or whatever. Uh, you know, people will need to, to the extent that they've been deracinated, will have to return to a way of conceiving of themselves that gives them agency uh, and allows them to act in the world. But we're fighting for bigger things. We're fighting for the future. You know, uh, I've been reading uh, Hauntology by Mark Fisher, and he talks a lot about how uh, in the chapter Lost Futures, he talks a lot about how the future is something that was taken from us, uh, that we had a conception of the future. The future never arrived and that we're living in this eternal presence, pres this eternal present. Uh, and this is so much this this has so much to do with with the deaths of despair and kind of cultural decay and the lack of innovation in art and music and all of these different kinds of things. Uh, we're fighting for all the marbles. Uh, and that's not, while race is important to that, uh, being able to think of yourself as, as having a particular ethnic identity or belonging to a particular racial category is essential just as having a religious identity is essential, just as having a kind of vocational identity or whatever, whatever, you, however you want to think of it. Uh, but we're fighting for bigger things. Um, and so it's as important as everything else. It's not more important than everything else, but it, Matt Parrott said this, so I'm going to give Matt Parrott credit here. You take it away, you really feel its absence. And that's kind of the situation that 
white Western countries have found themselves in, where we have all these surplus identities, all these, you know, that the market of identities, things that are commodities that you can choose and select from, but they are they're they're not authentic. They're like, like simulacra. They're 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 perishable, basically. You know, they're not anti-fragile. Uh, to borrow a term from uh, from that guy who wrote the book Anti-Fragile. <laughs> I can't remember his name at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's important. You definitely feel its absence. Uh, it's not the most important thing. Uh, I I would to me not being a scholar of third positionism. It really is about bigger goals, bigger ambitions, and that's something I don't think we should lose sight of. Yeah, I agree with that. That was very well said. I mean, at least for me, I'll just answer this in a bit of a different way. When it comes to my own commitments, the thing that got me into this in the first place was, of course, the plight and scapegoating and the minoritization of whites, right? That's a main concern for me. When it comes specifically to third positionism, yeah, not all varieties of third positionism are strictly racial, right? But I do believe, for example, when you're looking at how cultures developed, how political systems develop, and I, of course, as everyone knows, I take the embodied cognition perspective. I think you need a biological understanding of race, and that does play a formative role in how a race sees itself and how it moves in the world and the kind of systems that it creates. But I don't think merely looking at from an evolutionary stance is entirely good enough, right? I think you have to look at it from the way in which culture and intersubjectivity and the way that um, you prop and you create a kind of self-understanding in a particular time does also play a formative role, not only on self-understanding, but also on the bio biological makeup, right? This is the embodied cognition perspective. So I don't remove the racial question at all when it comes to being constitutive. What I think though, is that and this is something we talked about a little bit in the George Grant stream was, is the idea that, right, we're fighting for survival of rights, right? We are. At the same time, though, I don't want whites to merely survive in an environmentalist way where they're just preserved but spiritually dead. I don't want them to survive in the way that, you know, they maintain a majority, but they remain liberals and they end up still destroying their families and things that are dear to them and they lack self-understanding, right? We've just preserved them. And so that's the lesson from George Grant, is just nationalisms are not valuable in themselves. It's how you actually have a vision of yourself going forward and your self-understanding of what you construct that's actually a healthier system for whites in the first place, right? And so I think the kind of nationalism or the kind of third positionism that we want is a very key question when it concerns white survival, because I don't want whites just to survive, I want them to thrive. Right. I want them to have a higher vision. I want them to realize the religious dimension and the past of them and the scientific pursuits, the things that made us great. Right. So that's definitely something I retain. Um, as for particularly when it comes to like a North American context, because I know, for example, when we did that stream with Culture Thug, we were talking about the North American context of, you know, there's a lot of non-whites within North America. And I think what we were trying to reach in this discussion was the fact that racial resentment, which is very real, by the way, I'm not saying I'm not a Marxist, I'm not saying race isn't real, and the capitalists are just weaponizing these ideas. What I'm saying is it is very real. But the only thing that's going to stop that is a strong fascist state that is willing to put the capitalist class at heel and hold them accountable for what they're doing. And within our own interests and within the idea of restoring a European hegemony. And this would be able to have a more healthier relationship in which we could actually you know, stop mass immigration and the things like that, the things that benefit the people that are trying to displace us, which at the end of the day is financial interest. It's the idea of the perfectibility of man and all the like. And I think these are questions we need to take seriously, but to sum it up, we need not just survive, but thrive. Josh and Nils, did you want to say on that anything else before I move on? Just one quick point, and then I'll kick it back to you guys. The, the, the observed among white people, uh, whether it's in my profession, day-to-day -day life here in the alt-right, uh, is there's kind of two positions or two attitudes people take towards race or whiteness, which is that on one extreme, it's an object of derision. And on the other extreme, it's an object of fetishization. Uh, and I think both are not 
psychologically conducive. I don't think both. I don't think either. It, they're both two extremes, which which fundamentally uh, compromise autonomy, autonomous action. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that we have to find a comfortable middle ground, but I do think we need to relate to uh, our kind of ethnic racial particularities in a coherent, healthful manner, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, if I recall the question uh, correctly, the, the guy who posted it actually asked whether it was possible or when it would be possible for a third positionist movement or a third position is thought to move beyond the racial question. I believe that was the wording he chose. And uh, I believe that is not possible because uh, racial questions determine uh, human beings in a way that has to be taken into account to uh, come up with conclusions to determine a proper politicking in a, in a realist way. And uh, of course, um, in the dissident right or whatever you want to call it, uh, there, there are sometimes fingers pointed at, at the mere race realists and the, the human biodiversity guys uh, for uh, releasing the umpteenth book about, here's how uh, blacks are overrepresented in the US prison system. And there has to be a reason for that. And we need to take that into account and uh, have a proper prison reform and uh, look at this. And we have to uh, figure out what the hell is going on. And of course, that's uh, n not exactly what uh, politics proper are because that is just uh, in, in, in the best case uh, some treatment of symptoms but not eradicating the illness that uh, has befallen the, 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 the nation in and of itself but um, in a way uh, as, as uh, you put it Tyler it would be too materialistic to just see the race and not the, the 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 person or the group behind that. That is one reason why many uh, yeah third positionist or fascist philosophers like uh, Julius Evola and Francis Parker Yockey chose mm, to redefine the term race into something that includes uh, the biological and genetical component, but goes beyond that and also includes um, uh, traits of character and behavior and, and uh, things that, that would uh, rather be placed into, into the, the areas of psychology and sociology and, and not exactly into, into uh, biology and eugenics and stuff like that. So uh, of course race uh, is important and race won't go away and any realistic approach to politics has to take that into account. But it is nothing that should be the prime mover of any political movement and any serious attempt at uh, battering things for whites on a, on a, on a political level. Yeah. yeah, two two quick points and then then uh, I'll return it back to you guys. You know, there's 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 kind of like the evolist evolist position on race and then there's the HBD position on race and some synthesis of that dialectic has to happen where we think of there's being certain characters, moral characters belonging to particular peoples. Um, but but marrying that to you know, Darwinist kinds of uh, evolutionary understandings of of different race groups, which takes into account takes into account, you know, things like geographically where people evolved in and 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 things like that. Um, and I think people get stuck in one area or the other. And the alt right, for sure, has been stuck in that HBD Charles Murray IQ style fetishization of race. Um, the other point I wanted to make here in the United States, I guess, since I'm the representative here, uh, you know, we often hear people 
mostly on the left, but increasingly more on the right, talk about uh, how America hasn't got over its racist past. past. And uh, I agree with this, although I would change the language around a little bit. You know, we have never, we haven't really solved the race problem here in the United States. Uh, America is, the United States is the big, uh, it's, it's ground zero for this crazy multiracial experiment that the rest of the world is now being imported elsewhere. Uh, and we've not solved that problem in any meaningful way. You know, we, we're, we're trying to solve it in terms of forcing uh, different ethnic groups into a white liberal psychology. We're trying to do all these other crazy things. Uh, there's a lot of work there to be done. Yeah, well, I mean, just to quickly comment on that, I do agree. For example, like, I know I might be sounding like a broken record at this point, but this is my appeal when it comes to embodied cognition is that we're not like Marxists. We're not class reductionists. We don't look to class to explain everything. We're not like trad cast in that we look to religion to explain everything. We're not like um, what Raymond Tallis calls neuromaniacs or Darwinitis, where we look to neuroscience or we look to Darwin to explain absolutely everything. The embodied cognition theorist looks at the ways in which these different networks actually work together and infect each other. And it gives us a more holistic way of understanding the reality of, of race. And I would say a more scientifically accurate way. And, and I would say a way more true to experience and even religious experience and even questions of class, right? And there's actually, by the way, there's a part two of this question. I didn't know this. It just says, is 3P an inherently exclusionary ideology and could you not extend it on a global scale? I would think it is more extended on a global scale. Like when you look at fascism, it localizes the particular cultures and all the cultures that adopt versions of fascism are actually, you know, white, right? And I find there is more genuine respect among genuine third positionists than there are right between other, you know, the liberal left, which is always trying to like baby and tell other people like while they're secretly saying they're really tolerant, they're actually saying, you know, your culture is an exotic tourist destination for me or something like, do you see what I mean? It's very much putting it within a liberal consumerist framework. And I think genuine third positionists do have a better relation with others all over the world because they recognize the importance of preserving their own culture and localizing it and realizing it as a group, right? And I think there's more lines for alliances there than with any other kind of ideology. And then it says, what should the response be to someone who said that we should move past racial boundaries? I don't think we should move past racial boundaries would be my response. I think you just have to integrate it into a better understanding of race and what makes humans humans in the first place. Do you guys want to chime in there? Um, just one, I hope, quick uh, point. If I recall correctly, the more radical civil rights activists, people like uh, Malcolm X, um, would advocate not for a societal merging of, uh, of blacks and whites and the desegregation that eventually took place, but rather for whites and blacks to stay segregated on a social level and live together within the United States, but separately as political entities. Uh, so whites would police whites, blacks would police blacks, and there would be some, some kind of uh, caucus on a governmental level to, um, to do uh, the, the detailed paperwork, but pretty much it would be like, uh, like, like, um, I'm okay. The, the Turks and the Kurds may be uh, a, a little bad of an example, but just like two two peoples living on the on the same territory and uh, pretty much uh, separated by by law by institutions. And uh, do you think that would have been if it if it uh, had come that way would have been a good launching pad for some sort of third positionist uh, politics because um, most of the of the civil rights leaders of course uh, were more or less hardlined Marxists or leftists of, of other ilk but uh, 
at least Malcolm X was uh, very intense against capitalism and against uh, certain friends with uh, uh, less less big uh, head um, garments as as you have, Tyler. But uh, yeah, maybe there would have been some synergies, and uh, I, I believe we all know of, of, of certain, um, let's say, advocates for white interests back in the '60s that uh, uh, well played some footsie with with Malcolm X and the the Black Muslims and and other radical organizations back then. Yeah, do you want to jump in there, Josh? Because I would say there could have been a fertile ground there. I mean, you look at a lot of like the 60s liberation movements, the post-colonial movements, but largely influenced by Marxism. Regardless, they did always resort to some kind of nationalism, right, in their own articulation. I mean, it was done through a rather tortured Marxist lens, but nonetheless, it was there. And it was present, and I think it would have been a fertile ground and could maybe still be, but although I'd be skeptical about that now because is the movements that you're seeing all right they're claiming marxism while be, cl while acting like liberals they just want to see the power they don't want to actually change the course of american politics they just want to be the ones at the top of it right and so that would be my skepticism now in that regard but um yeah next question let me see here loading loading okay there's quite a few all right, from from Insane Hermit again for 10. I'm not a fan of Halsey, but he thinks that the left are desperate. BLM and Antifa are only active in Democrat-run cities, and that the military will not just follow orders to attack citizens in a civil war, but will likely be divided. What is the panel's thoughts? Can you, can you summarize that quickly? I, I didn't get the whole gist of that. So he's, say, so he's saying that BLM and Antifa are only active in Democrat-run cities, and that the military will not just follow orders to attack citizens in a civil war scenario, but would more likely be divided. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with either of those premises. And Halsey's a moron, <laughs> and he's also subversive, uh, and he's also irrelevant. So I don't really know why we're talking about him, but uh, I don't agree with either of those premises. Uh, the, the couple in st louis that was recently memed into kind of national consciousness uh recently were just served uh they were served a warrant and i think had all of their firearms taken away uh so the idea that the military or the federal government uh won't uh, pursue kind of hostile uh enforcement of the law against the average white person or the white family or the average republican or whatever it's totally ridiculous um, and if you look at the demographic of the military, that also doesn't really seem to bear out. Uh, it's increasingly uh, more Hispanic. It's increasingly uh, just multi-ethnic. Um, and, and the whites that get involved are, I want to say this in a very disciplined way, goofy conservative whites. I mean, they're, they're, they're a throwback. They are a throwback to an era where that mentality was justifiable and noble. And now it's just self-flagellating. So, yeah, I, I, would, I, I don't, I don't agree with the second premise and the first premise about BLM only being active in Democrat-run uh, states or cities. I don't know if that's factually true, but that's also kind of irrelevant. I don't, I don't really see why that matters so much. Uh, it seems like a very red shirt, blue shirt way of looking at the issue. Um, and if you want to look at it on a on a national level the supreme court basically are progressive liberals the lower courts are basically progressive liberals the media is progressive liberal the academic uh, institutions are progressive liberal so even if these are only being you know kind of these these blm flash mob things are only happening in uh democratic enclaves they have institutional capture everywhere else so well, that was so perfectly stated. I'm not going to try to follow it up. Nils, did you have anything you want to add? I'm 100% on board with Josh on this. And not only for the US, but uh, all over the West. It's It's uh, been a huge thing uh, ever since those uh, 
Pegida marches started in uh, 2000, in, in late 2014, and um, got big after the the beginning of the refugee wave in 2015. That people were saying, even um, well, let's say intellectuals of of uh, the conservative and uh, the right uh, milieu would say that the police were unofficially on our side and, and even the military and uh, there were some large uh, calls published by retired uh, uh, German military generals uh, calling for the Bundeswehr for the federal armed forces to turn against the government because they violated the constitution and uh, stuff like that and uh, personally I never see that happening because uh yeah you might idealize the military and of course it's a very right wing thing to do to idealize and idolize in in the meaning of idol that you just uh, talked about before tyler to to idolize the military but this is not going to happen not not in the in the late modern west uh those those people are servants of the state and this is where they get their money from if they get money and um the the state politics is determined by the government and the government is just uh liberal with a certain uh color painted over it be it red where they are social democrats or be it black where they are christian democrats and uh it's all the same all over europe and even in Hungary, I'm uh, sad to, uh, quite sad, and uh, to 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 stress that. And in Poland, based Poland, but no, the the military is nothing to rely upon. The police, uh, even less, nothing like like the big military coup uh, of of some uh, Pinochet uh, is going to happen anywhere in the West. And uh, yeah. Especially you burgers, uh, I guess you all know it. I mean, remember Waco, remember Ruby Ridge. This is what uh, government agencies are doing and uh, have been doing over the past 50 or 80 years, and it's only getting worse. And anyone who doubts that, uh, where when, when, when you hold a rally like Kurt little just did and turn it into a pre-revolutionary event of sorts that you really believe that there's not some reaper drone uh striking you down as soon as you get really dangerous then you're gravely mistaken not only in the us maybe yeah. there are gonna be more yeah. over here in europe but uh yeah that's what's gonna happen and you have to be pretty stupid not to anticipate that yeah, right. you can look at Waco, Ruby Ridge, but uh, also during the waning years of the Obama administration, the Bundy uh, family debacle, which was kind of a complicated situation, but it was also very similar where the federal government came in uh, and they acted against, uh, you know, citizens who owned private land and, and, and were effectively, you know, doing the whole sovereign citizen routine and uh, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what legal rights that they had, it didn't matter uh, fealty to the constitution or any of these goofy things. None of it mattered. Yeah, you guys have tackled this question so well that I don't know what I could add to it. I agree with both you guys. We have a lot of questions to get through, so I'm going to move to the next one. All right. From Corbeck, I think maybe Nils would know more about this being in Germany, but this is aimed at Russia, but this is more of the continent. So are you aware of Russian social and political climate and events? If so, what do you think will happen in Russia during the short or long-term future? What do you think of Putin and his government? Is basically he's asking, is Russia a last bastion of Europe or another failure? Now, I am not particularly too well versed in Russian politics. So Nils, it looks like you want to chime in there. Uh, yeah, I guess I kind of have to because uh, I'm the one who's uh, sitting the closest to the Russian border <laughs> of the three of us. But uh, I'm, I'm not really invested in that whole thing as well. Um, I mean, of course, ever since uh, he assumed power for the first time, uh, Putin has always been fun to watch and uh, it has always been great when he made the liberals cry all over Europe and uh, the whole world. 
um, the staring contests with uh, the respective American president have been kind of creepy sometimes, but well, I guess that's what happens between America and Russia uh, until one of them eventually uh, collapses completely. Um, but I, I, I kind of want to uh, attack the viewpoint that begets such questions because um, be it in geopolitics or be it in party politics, this this whole uh, this this whole shtick of always looking for the next big ally and somebody else to to rest one's head against is a a posture, a, a moral and and motivational posture that that I'm not okay with because this is what got us where we are now and um it's 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 not to our best to try and and always look for the lesser of two evils or the lesser of a hundred evils to uh to get in bed with like the gop or the 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 the, uh, the christian democrats in various european countries because uh yeah we've been uh, betrayed and sold down the river all the time and uh, i guess it's time to 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 yeah take a step back look at the mistakes that were made and uh yeah try to think of something completely different it's time to step I don't have a whole lot to add to the framework question. and to to yeah to come up with something new as long as we still can yeah I, i'll just second what Mill said, and I don't have a whole lot to add because I'm not a geopolitical galaxy brain, but um, Putin is kind of this quixotic figure, and I think the appeal to Western right-wing uh, factions is that he is one of the few global strongmen, uh, and the image he, pro he projects um, resonates with people who want that here. Uh, am I yes, coming through all right? The no, you're, up. Yeah. Uh, you're fine. I can hear you okay, guys. yeah. So the, thing, the only other thing I would say is, um, from what I do understand, you know, there are Russian oligarchs that are connected with the Chabad Lubavitch party in Israel. Uh, that would be cause for concern. Um, I've heard rumblings about Putin extending his, uh, his presidency or, or making further paragraphs. I can't speak to that, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's again, it's I don't want to dog on Christianity, but it's it seems kind of reminiscent of like this projecting of a savior archetype out externally. Somebody else is going to do the hard work for us, um, and in this life, we have to do it for ourselves. Yeah, I second that. It's always we're waiting for the next savior to come along and save us. You know. Uh, Armin Mola uh, in the early 70s or late 60s, I believe, wrote something about the political climate in Western Germany. Armin Mola is the guy who came up with the term of the conservative revolution. Um, and he said that the whole political landscape of uh, Western Germany, of the Federal Republic of Germany, was determined not by are uh, gathering data and evaluating what was best for the state and for the people but to uh, look into history books and look at what hitler did and then do the exact opposite of that and um, that is pretty much the same uh, i personally believe when people who are uh again some on a on a on a uh rather subconscious or half conscious level who are against liberalism and against the american way of life and 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 uh are uh still pretty uh pretty butthurt uh about uh, the occupation time and and stuff like that um 
who who plainly uh, are anti-Western, anti-liberal, and want to revolt against the modern world, blah, 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 blah. So they look for someone who is equally powerful, but opposed to the US. And they, of course, find Vladimir Putin. Uh, some of them are pretty much the same people also uh, are quite in, in favor, but in a playful way, kind of, kind of as a meme uh, in favor of uh, Kim Jong Un, for example, or or the Chai comes um, to own the lips, of course. And this is this is a very childish way of uh, thinking about politics, even even uh, on a geopolitical st scale. And uh, it's it's a waste of time to think about it in in terms in in, in these terms. And we should think about what is best for us. Uh, in our respective uh, countries, but but also beyond that, and uh, not rely on any external power to uh, ride in on a white horse or a white uh, tank and, and eventually save the day, because that is something especially Russia will not do, because uh, if we have seen, uh, what, what we have seen during the last uh, few decades is that uh, beyond all the, all the uh, saber rattling uh both the us and russia will always avoid any kind of hot war or 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 uh official uh exchange of gunfire and stuff like that and uh they will always shy away from that and everyone who uh relies too heavy on that like poland for example will uh be gravely mistaken All right. Really well said. All right. Let's keep getting through these questions. All right. Next one from Kat. For me, what are your thoughts on the tension between French and Anglophones and New Brunswick specifically? Why do you think Acadians are generally more concerned with in-group preference and self-advocacy -ad than the Anglo-descended loyalists, Anglo-loyalist descendants? There ain't no French in Jersey, okay? Let me just get that out the, out the way right now. There ain't no French in Jersey. You and your Jersey. All right. You know, I feel kind of bad about this question because I'm actually from New Brunswick, but the current situation there is not something I'm overly familiar with. But there is a historical case for why that this is the case. Right. So I'm just going to stop my cam for a quick second. So if you, if you, uh, sorry, one sec. I'm back. I don't sneeze for a second there. Okay. So when you had the okay, so when you had the French colonialists in the in the maritime, so Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, they of course they called it Acadias, and those were you those were the Acadians, right? And so when the British they took over Canada, they expected everybody, including the Acadians, to actually defend this new kingdom, right? Uh, or this extension of the kingdom, I should say. And the British basically said, you Acadians have to accept our, um, you have to accept the Protestant religion. And the, the Acadians basically said, no, we're not doing that. We're protecting our way of life. And so the British government basically respond by expelling their families, burning villages and things like that. It was completely horrible. And so when they started being separated, they started fleeing. Right. So a lot of them actually flee to Louisiana, interestingly enough, you know, not New Orleans and things like that. I actually have family that went to um, Louisiana. I recently found that out because I'm apparently Acadian and then we ran, fled to Louisiana. Then some of them actually came back once the little reign of terror ended. Right. And so this is why you have a stronger in-group preference with them, much in the same way that you, you see in Quebec, right, is they were there too they were actually expelled from france and then they were within the colony and they tried to defend their way of life and the british government said you have to accept our protestant religion and they were attacked for it right so they've always had a greater sense of why they're not ink they're not americans or they're not within the current uh you could say spiritual crisis that anglo canadians are in anglo canadians as we talked about in the lament for the nation episode have always been prime for being brought into this Americanist project that is currently preventing them from understanding who they are, right? And so they've always, because they had that legacy of 
being different and knowing that they're different and being attacked for it by the British government is why that there's tension between them in New Brunswick and the Anglo-Canadians, right? Um, so from another one from Kurt Doolittle BBC, which is a great name. Your EBL on Grant had a profound effect on me. It only just occurred to me that I weep for idols that represented a culture that has long since died, namely Mosley and Powell. What do we do when our culture has been reduced to a bland simulacrum? Josh, you want to jump in there first? Um, hmm. Well, that's the perennial question, right? That's what we're all trying to do. Well, I mean, there are people like Mark Brahman who are trying to create a new culture. Uh, there are people like Jeff, uh, Jeff Winston, I think, of the White Art Collective, who are trying to do that. Uh, if you have the skills and you have the means and you have high agency, you're willing to take the lumps for it. I mean, Arvel's doing this too. Arvel just uh, did a video the other day about starting his own uh, commune or something to that effect, which would be centered around the uh, philosophy and the arts. Uh, something like um, kind of Ernst Jünger's idea of retreating into the forest uh you know break away detach from all of this clear your head clear your heart uh build your skills create something new and and just do what you can i, I, I it's not a glamorous answer but i don't really see there as being any other option if you're a writer write stuff that will build the next generation of culture creators if you're a, a, a painter or a, a filmmaker Maker or a musician, then then do the same thing. If you're a political theorist, uh, do the same thing. Parallel uh, cultural creation, I think, uh, is is the only way forward. I, I I'm skeptical, um, really skeptical of like infiltrating different institutions. I've been a musician here in New York City for how old am I? Half of my life, you know, active in the New York scene, um, and it's you know it's a closed circuit it's a closed ecosystem and unless you're willing to do really gross things to yourself and to the people around you to curry favor with with uh the people who are in charge and even then you're not going to be able to do it on your own terms uh you know it's not 1972 anymore you know where you can be like david bowie and you can amass all this cultural social capital and then just keep doing whatever you want for the next 70 years or 50 years or whatever that those opportunities don't exist um so yeah i mean get back to basics sorry for the unglamorous answer what about you nails there do you have a also non-glamorous answer yeah i i guess uh all realistic answers are pretty non-glamorous um I agree with Josh on this, and I find it very important to steer people away from this whole infiltration stuff, not only regarding the GOP or whatever party you would want to take over, but also cultural institutions. And I believe, especially in Europe, but also in the US, there has been a very harmful and malign fixation on 1968 as a as a meme because it is largely misunderstood what happened back then and uh people uh try to project themselves and their political movements into some sort of uh cultural revolutionary uh, cultural guerrilla meme that uh, that is that is just counterfactual into something that has never existed and this 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 whole uh uh this, the, the teachings of, of uh, Antonio Gramsci, which are the, the groundwork of uh, what is called metapolitics in, in, in nowadays sense, um, are plain, uh, often misunderstood and are very closely connected to the mass societies of, of, the, of the early uh, 20th century. Sorry, twentieth century, which are just not existent anymore, and um, 
because of that and because of uh, various other reasons, I've uh, been working for quite some months now on a lengthy, a lengthy treatise of this problem, uh, which I uh, titled plainly uh, Fuck Matter Politics. But uh, I believe that won't be uh, finished uh, anytime soon. So, um, yeah, the, the thing is to actually detach oneself from uh, the from the disseminators of, of garbage and of filth and and poison, the 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 uh, cultural distorters as as Yaki uh, called them, as much as possible while preserving one's own talents and one's own creativity. Uh, we are, uh, I, um, yeah, I guess I'm kind of uh, unwillingly chan channeling Mark Brahman here. We are a, uh, a Faustian, a Faustian, a Promethean uh, people, a Promethean race, and we are kind of uh, forced by our own uh, energy, our T level, call it whatever you want to create. Uh, I personally believe that anyone has uh, his talents, something he can do especially well, and it's it's everyone's uh, it's everyone's obligation to find out what is his talent and then to act out on it and to contribute to uh, society. And if society is shit, then just contribute to your peer group, to a group of of like-minded people. And if you don't have one, then build one. And uh, this is pretty much what it all comes down to. Um, build some sort of subculture in, in, the, in, the, in the real meaning of the word and don't become a scene where everyone uh, just wears a, a fancy merchandise shirt or some, some uh, tote bag uh, where his, uh, his political uh, allegiance is is written down on, but uh, actually fill that with life and uh, try to stay away from the from the mainstream, whatever that may uh, imply, as far and as uh, thorough thoroughly as possible. Don't uh, read their news. Read our own news. Um, Eric Stryker and, and others are doing great things uh, with with their respective websites. Um, stay away from uh, their media as much as you can. Don't uh, consume the garbage that they hand out for you, be it uh, food, be it uh, video games, what have you. And try to uh, try to contribute to the struggle of your people, be it on a monetary or on a creative basis. That's pretty much all we can do. And if we get more people on board with that, um, and I believe we can uh, to a certain degree, then uh, this whole thing might be self-sustainable in the end. We will see. Very well. Anyone who's tried to do this knows the, uh, the inherent difficulties of it. And Mark Fisher kind of eloquently uh, describes why it's hard for innovative culture creation um, because of the creeping neoliberalism of the last few decades. Again, I don't want to keep uh, going on and on about Mark Fisher. I, I'm a big fan of his, uh, and I'm reading more of his work now. But uh, it's in ontology, to anyone in the audience. Yeah, in in ontology, he talks about how. Um, you know, neoliberalism broke up structure and solidarity. Uh, it broke down the economic abilities for artists to get together and innovate. Um, and and the again, the eternal the the the, the, the feeling of an eternal presence um, cultivates this kind of atmosphere of nostalgia, where the only culture creation that happens is always hearkening back to some other time. And and you know, when I look back at my kind of career as a songwriter uh, that describes what I, you know, the approach I took to a T. Oh, well, I want to catch the next wave, but the next wave is, is calling back to the pre to, to two waves ago or three waves ago. And it's, it's very difficult to be um, different. It's very difficult to be an innovator. Um, so it, it may sound simple we'll just do it build it yourself <laughs> start your own community build your skills but it's fantastically difficult it's demoralizing it's it's 
it's um but it's always worthwhile too i mean i, I wouldn't trade the last 20 years of my life for anything yeah the only thing i disagree with you guys on is not wearing trendy clothes i think everyone in the movement should have cowboy hats and gator boots so like come on let's be real but no there's nothing i'd add to what you guys said there just like the last one you guys really nailed it so let's go to the next one because it's directly related to this and also from kurt doolittle bbc what would a structured plan for building parallel institutions look like what should those of us that aren't born to be dissidents do when the risks are too high for even communicating with like-minded people or contributing IRL? All right, you're staring at me. I guess I have to offer advice in this regard. But uh, I, for one thing I did want to add to what you guys were saying though about creating your own niche community and all these likes and cleansing yourself is a good value of actually finding like-minded people IRL and building something is that it helps this cleansing process of actually cutting yourself off from distractions of the world that bring you down. You need your brothers to actually be able to be willing to criticize you and to be willing to push you and actually cleansing that, right? And you have to be able to accept that criticism with an understanding of respect and that it's from a good place rather than, you know, instantly getting mad. Like there is this very leftover kind of egalitarianism within these circles where it's like, don't tell me what to do, blah, blah, blah. Like everything, every pushback is taken as something personal. In reality, it's trying to get rid of that weakness in yourself and you should be able to take it like a man. Right? And if you find those community appears, that hierarchy will form and it'll be a lot better. And it'll be better for you and for all those people. You all grow together and you'll create that mythologization rather than trying to put it on something and then be like, okay, now we have to conform to this set of mythology or whatever, or this rebirth of our culture. It's rather, it comes by this process of transformation and it becomes from action, right? From living in the world and creating that on a practical matter. And then all the theoretical stuff follows with it. And it proceeds in some ways and it also learns from it. There's an interplay there, but you see what I mean. Uh, I would also say, you know, to the point or to the question of, of, you know, how do you, what's the plan or how do you build a new structure? Um, you know, what we don't have uh, or what we have a hard time attracting or keeping hold of are, you know, people who effectively, you know, to use the big five model, uh, high conscientiousness, like managerial types, basically, you know, people who are very orderly, timely, methodical, uh, ball breakers and, and kind of whip crackers who will, uh, straighten us creative types out and hold our feet, feet to the fire. So, I mean, if you want to build something, then you need to have, uh, good relationships with people who are not necessarily leaders, but managerially minded, because all of the operational stuff that happens behind the scenes is the most important stuff. Um, if the alt right is, is an example of anything, it's that you can find any idiot who's willing to put himself in front of a camera. I'm one of those idiots. Uh, you know, it's, it doesn't take a lot to do. It's inexpensive. Um, you don't have to be particularly talented. Anyone can do it. Um, but not anyone can run a multi-million dollar organization and not anyone can run uh, an organization with a shoestring budget um so so if you're if you're interested in a parallel construction uh then you need to identify people who are capable of running uh that construction process so yeah well that's really the main thing right it's the whole problem of very few people want to be Indians, they want to be chiefs. And on the other side of that, you have, you know, successful family men or people with business that don't understand how they can get involved because they only see forward facing parts of the movement, right? They don't see all the boring work and the work that requires, as Josh was saying, the managerial side of things, which is extremely important though, right? When we on here, we're, we're largely creative types, right? We're writers or thinkers or whatever. And so what happens is we often, when we try to come together in a space with creative types, you end up with conflict often or confliction, conflicting visions. And you need someone with a managerial spirit to actually bring these things together into 
something coherent, right? And to actually manage all these different personalities and to manage all the pieces which aren't really that glam glamorous, like organization and funding and all this and, you know, charity and lawyer legal stuff, right? All this stuff that's not particularly glamorous or fun, but it's extremely necessary and critical, especially right now, it's more critical than ever before. And we're a little bit late getting to that point, but I think people are starting to realize that now. And so I think if, if, if you know, you're worried about being involved, you're you know, a family man, you don't want to lose your job. There's things you can do behind the scenes with trustworthy people, you know, like, you know, like us or whoever, well, maybe not whoever, but people you can trust. Right. And then you could form these communities and then it doesn't even have to be like shouldering all the burdens of the movement on your own shoulders. When you get together with a group of guys and you know, you, you kind of figure out like, ah, I can contribute this way. I, I just talked to this brother here and I talked him down from being too black pilled or something, right? Like every little thing, when you actually get together, it's hard to spell it out, but people help each other and they start becoming more trusting. And then once you just take the step and doing this and meeting, you'll find that everybody does have a place, really. It's just hard to spell it out on a stream. But once you take that step, you'll know that you don't need to put your face up there. You don't need to do other things that are going to get you in trouble, right? You can stay down key and you could do the right thing because community building isn't about projecting to the whole world what we're doing, right? There's only so much you can say on a stream without being like, hey guys, this is our tactic. The left or the you know, feds are watching. This is what we're doing. So uh, yeah, write this down. We have to be somewhat behind the scenes about it, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually uh, not quite sure what I can still uh, contribute to that personally i believe that this this whole uh community building thing that was very early on in the old right days pioneered by groups like the uh the houston goilers for example who just got together and went hiking and, and they were a little rp they they uh, uh went hiking in uh kind of black uniforms and called it hate hikes. And then they would uh, go with with uh, 25 people in, in black uh, army fatigues to uh, to some some uh, to some drive in and you know, sit there and eat together and uh, laugh about uh, other people there, especially if they were black and stuff like that. But in the end, this is this is also uh, people like this this Ahab guy, which I like, and his his Manor Bund, uh podcast are all about. It's it's about showing other people that a different kind of living is possible, and that they are not completely on their own and just just uh, mind and soulless uh, drones in in this corporate society. And this is this is the main thing. This is the first step to to get people out of this 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 uh this uh this this ice block this societal ice block of isolation and and uh ersatz uh, satisfactions and to make them see that another way of life is still possible and to slowly get there to to uh to become a real counterculture and not uh, to take the i don't know 30th step before the first one and talk about how uh, anyone can make as much of a profit as possible out of that because uh when we look back into history um at uh i don't know the the romanian iron guard for example or certain um german parties of the past for example all of this stuff was never uh about earning money or, or gaining a profit, but all all those uh, gatherings were um, uh, self-sustained in a way that they took money from their members, which were employed otherwise. And um, the situation that we see nowadays that it's easier to lose a job than it is to get one, especially uh, thanks to Twitter and, and uh, cancel culture and world capital and stuff like that. Even if you're a CEO of some, some uh, company that belongs to Google or what have you, um, this makes it way more difficult, but not impossible. And personally, I'm not quite sure 
whether or not we would actually want some CEO of some uh, big tech company or something like that within our circles. I mean, of course, people are always looking uh, for uh, for for financiers and uh, looking at people like Peter Thiel and and Elon Musk, who uh, every now and then appear to be a, a little uh, hashtag our guys or stuff like that. But maybe that's the wrong approach. Maybe the right approach is uh, bottom up, not uh, top down. And um, yeah, we should we should try and uh, help each other on the uh, societal level, on the class level that we are in ourselves. And uh, as I said, not think too much of uh, forming or leading a multi-million dollar uh, company before we have even gotten us uh, a, a friendly round of people, maybe even with children that we can uh, speak freely when we are among them. Yeah, I, I just, I just echoed elsewhere. Um, the a good model, 1930s, you know, some of those guys in the continent got it right and they did it by creating something that could then merge successfully with powerful institutions up the ladder when they became undeniable. Um, I, we don't have the luxury We're I think we're very much in a similar position. Uh, in terms of just the total distaste uh, that the establishment has for for us, for our worldview, for our opposition to their plans, uh, we have a little, we have so much work to do. So much work to do. Yeah, but don't overstretch the the uh, comparison because the the Weimar government was weak. It was not strong, and our Western governments are strong in, in these days and they are very entrenched in their uh, late capital and and woke liberal ideologies. And uh, the, the Weimar government was not willing to crack down. They tried it against Prussia, but they failed. And uh, our governments nowadays would be more than willing to crack down if, uh, if need be. So uh, we should be a little, we, should, we, we yeah, I, I, know, I know what you mean. I get what you mean, but uh, we should not overstretch the comparison because the, the situation is, uh, the, 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 the materialistic side of the situation is a, is a whole different one. But uh, when we are talking about idealism and uh, the way um, one must, uh, okay, I don't want to sound too dramatic, but the way one must harden his soul or, uh, I, I, I think you know what I mean. Um, it might yeah. actually be kind of comparable, especially when it comes to fighting in the streets in, in these days where, where Black Lives Matter and uh, Antifa mobs are uh, roaming freely. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Well taken. I would say the biggest problem, at least in the American context, is the leftover libertarian mindset that is still always infecting, right? It's this idea, and I, I see this all the time. Like, we need to tell white people that you need to learn to live in the rural, the countryside. You got to know how to have your weapons. You got to learn how to defend yourself or to be self sustaining. The problem with all this is it's terribly individualistic, right? You don't form those networks in which, quite frankly, especially when you're living in a hyper technological age, that's simply not good enough. You're going to get your ass kicked. And that's something that a message I think people need to hear and they need to internalize is getting over that libertarian mindset is probably the most crucial thing when it comes to actually trying to organize within North America. And you could really only do that starting with a small group of people that are willing to take that first step. It's absolutely paramount and we need to do it. But that whole libertarian mindset is so very, very dominant within these circles even. And it's, it's a serious problem. But if the right people take the Take the right steps they'll demonstrate it by their action right um next question which non-rightist thinkers are you guys influenced by or do you think that we should read definitely do not say marx that's it things except don't say marx was what it was I'll, I'll just answer that one quickly off the bat i mean i'm when it comes to political theory anyways i take a lot of influence from people like a gombin for example when he 
talks about biopolitics, which is uh, what actually me and Nils talked about. We did this episode on Agamben and the biopolitical paradigm of the modern, which I think there's a lot of gold there to worry, even if I don't agree with his anarchism at the end of the day. He does make a lot of good points about the whole concept of human rights and that how it includes the idea of, through means of exclusive inclusion, the biopolitical control over life. And I think that's a lot of truth in that, and which is why you can't use rights talk when talking about, you know, whites have a right to this. If you use right talk, you're giving too much to the current paradigm that's basically by means of exclusion, including the power to dominate life over it. Right? And you see that in the court system, the way in which the kind of suspension of the proper functioning of the law plays into this biopolitical, biopolitical control when it comes to like people like James Fields, for example. So I think there's a lot that we could learn from people like Agamben, people like Baju as well. I don't agree with his conclusions, but he has interesting analysis. Zizek, obviously. But I'll also say I actually take more influence from not even political writers, really. When I'm talking, when I try to think about like racial questions or religious questions or spiritual questions and put them in a political way, of course, this is not surprising. I get more opinions. I get more insight opinions and influence from you know phenomenology you know, people like Jean-Luc Marion people like Husserl people like Levinas people like Merleau Ponty who don't who aren't doing political writing even people like Soren Kierkegaard proto-existentialist right I find more helpful stuff when it comes to political and major political and metapolitical questions than I do get from actually reading uh, political theory texts which I kind of find to be not in a sweeping way but a lot of it kind of obvious right Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd second Zizek, um, and I would also second reading not explicitly political thinkers, although uh, I've gotten a lot out of Foucault lately, I've gotten a lot out of Baudrillard lately, uh, I've gone back to read some Carl Jung, these are, these are people I like, these are people who inform a lot of my thinking. Um, yeah, what's more to add? Um... I guess we can all agree on the importance and relevance of, of uh, post-structuralist uh, thinkers. And you already named Baudrillard, what would have been uh, my first pick. Um, a lot of right-wingers and especially uh, boilerplate conservatives always shy back from this whole post-modernist thing because they get it completely wrong and don't know anything about it and are just proud of their ignorance and go rambling on about oh, the deconstruction of, of everything and our values and what have you. Yeah, we don't need to 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 get too deep into this this uh, ignorant posture, but it actually is important, and we actually live in an age where the meta narratives or the, the 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 big stories that once held societies together are falling apart rapidly, or already have fallen apart. I guess, especially in the U.S., we are now uh, l looking at this whole societal. Um, glue uh, coming apart and uh, yeah that's exactly the postmodern condition that uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard pointed out and so uh, get yourself acquainted with this especially when it comes to media theory because it is it is something that interests me the most it is very instructive to to actually think about the way we are conditioned to see and to perceive things because this informs our way of looking at ourselves. And uh, it is very important to get this uh, poison out of your system. Um, and besides that, oh, well, uh, what can I say? Um, I'm pretty much only reading post-structuralists or right-wing authors, I believe. Um, yeah, it's it's never wrong to know a bit about political theory, even if the author is, is uh, a pronounced left winger, um, especially when it comes to the theory of fascism. Uh, people like uh, the recently deceased uh, Zef Sternhell, uh, who has been, I believe, a Marxist in his younger years, as have so many, and then later became some sort of... Uh, yeah, liberal-leaning uh, Likud voting 
uh, Israeli. I don't really know what his what his later uh, political inclinations were, but uh, besides that, um, yeah, um, there's of course the 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 already mentioned Antonio Gramsci, who was a an Italian communist in the 1920s. Um, Wherever you live, you single person in the audience, uh, get informed about the uh, Marxist and communist movements of your country in the in the 1920s and 1930s. Most of those movements uh, were actually pretty based, as we would say nowadays. Uh, you know the, the 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 Stalinist doctrine of communism in one country alone, uh, as opposed to the Trotskyite uh, doctrine of world revolution, is something that right wingers must not copy, but can learn a lot from. And there are always gems to find in in this literature. But besides that, um. Go for the postmodernists. A lot of them have been uh, hard right wingers in their younger years. Uh, people like like um, Paul Deman and um, what was his name again? Um, Maurice Blanchot, who was also friends with Emmanuel Levinas. Um, I'm quite sure Tyler knows him. Those are people that uh, did some pretty. Uh, enjoyable things in, in their younger years and later became a little a, a little more toned down, but uh, there's a lot to read there. Go for the media theory, go for societal theory. Foucault may have been a very unpleasant person privately, uh, but he's written some very important stuff about power dynamics, and uh, it does not always have to be Carl Schmidt. Besides, that Carl Schmidt is very important. Yeah, you mentioned Levinas too. My my mentor is actually a, was a friend of Levinas. Levinas is dead now, of course. But I would like to do an EBL on Levinas at some time because he's definitely a thinker who's pretty obviously outside of our milieu, right? But he there certainly has a lot to say. I think his corrections to Heidegger are actually kind of more helpful to our movement than maybe in some ways even Heidegger is, which is a controversial statement, of course. But I think we should definitely talk about that. But you know, just to clarify what I meant, like I said, you know, political theory might be a little contemporary stuff doesn't really tell us very much the reason i say that i don't mean to come off too strong because obviously you can learn a lot right but what i mean is like i often get asked what's a good reading list for contemporary third position political theory and it doesn't really exist i think that's a gap that we kind of need to fill there's a couple stuff here and there and a lot of the other books broadly published since the ascension of the alt-right i think most people in these movements they kind of already understand it all already. Like it's a very basic, but I think anything really challenging or interesting is just not been done yet. I think there's a lot of crucial questions from our perspective that we haven't really addressed yet. And there needs to be more genuine political theory in this area. So that's what I mean when there's not too much to read right now, right? Because it's, it's, it's worked out, but it just doesn't really exist. It's just the same obvious kind of stuff that we all know. So that's to explain my comment on that there anyways. Um, so how much longer do you guys want to go? We're almost at an hour and 40 minutes, but there's still a lot of questions. So, well, I'm going to keep going. Because Nils is pretty late for you. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, I'll have to be the bus kill then. Let's do two more questions, and then I guess I'll have to give you two guys on your own. All right, cool. So... Also from Insane Hermit for five. Guys, do you have any idea how to transmute red pill rage energy into self-discipline and willpower? I also suggest to study and teach this because white gnats need to deal with it. So basically, how do you take the negative energy, the rage that we all feel when looking at the latest outrage and then transforming it into something productive? Well, uh, we kind of... This is a good question. Yeah, we kind of roundabout answered that that uh, a few questions ago by saying, you know, unplugging, retreat to the forest, that kind of thing. Uh, this is something Jefferson and I have been beating, banging this drum for over a year, which is, you know, a lot of the big right wing accounts on Twitter basically get by retweeting uh, outrage porn and demoralization porn. And there's just simply 
I don't see any reason for anybody to imbibe it. Certainly not a neophyte uh, or an initiate into this way of thinking. I just, I, I think, I think it establishes the wrong emotional kind of neurological patterns for people. But um, it, in my clinical experience, uh, whenever anyone came to me with a problem, you know, this is something I learned uh, from a mentor I had briefly, which is, you know, what's the what's this the simplest thing you could do right now? Uh, people get caught in big abstract lofty goals. They get caught in the big picture. They get caught in their either in some pattern of inertia where they're just kind of staying in place, but they're moving, but they're not going anywhere in particular, or they're inert altogether. Um, you know, if you have a lot of this pent up emotional stuff, the ask yourself this question, what's the first easiest thing I can do about this right now? And it might just be put down the phone. Uh, and then it might be after that, go for a run. And then it might be after that, let me open up my note uh, pad uh, uh, app on my phone and record some ideas. And then it might be six months later, a book or a business proposal or whatever, whatever it's going to be for whoever's dealing with this. But thinking small, really, 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 really small is the best way to get through this kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's really, even if you're not looking at like people retweeting outrage porn, you're still going to see it anyways every time there's something new that gets you really upset. And it's like what, uh, you know, George Grant was talking about how when he wrote Lament for a Nation, he wrote it out of a place of anger. But he had to learn to actually have, you know, hope in his later later years and actually put it towards a productive way of realizing the eternal order, right? Which you know sounds heady, but I mean, really, it's just that you have to take the necessary steps to be willing to abstract yourself from just pure anger and transforming into, you know, what? Like I got this. Things are getting bad, but you know, this is just an opportunity for us to actually step up and be who we are. You know, as a European men, I've always been. And it's the re it's a really is a great opportunity to to remember that right you you get you recorrect the course that you want you learn to embody that position again. What about you, Nails? What do you think? Um, personally, uh, I found it very important to set a goal to live for, especially when you're so filled up with rage that you just feel like burning out completely and some people might do um unwise things in such a state of uh, such a state of mind and others may just uh i don't know try to channel it into into uh usual uh bugman work until they i don't know die from a stroke at 55 and uh, this is this is not the condition we want to live in um do you find out what you can do to force yourself to stay alive and to strive for a better life for yourself and the people you care about and not to fall into this this trap of nihilism to just uh, live on to feed your rage and to live off your rage and and, and, and uh, yeah uh, channel this rage into other people that then will also come become enraged and I suppose this whole red pilling normies thing is uh, to to a large degree about getting other people to get mad about the things you are mad yourself. So, uh, yeah, buy a decrepit house and uh, start building it up on your own or uh, build a family and uh, do something that has a future worth and that makes it worthwhile for you to live and to struggle. That is the main thing that I would recommend. And most of the other stuff just falls in line. Find out what you can do best and find out how this ties in with the community you would like yourself and your loved ones in. That might sound easy, but it's not really. It's not impossible, but uh, it takes some strife. Uh, I would also encourage people to take up something like prayer. Uh, you know, be really serious about that kind of meditation, whatever, Zen practice, 
something uh, quiet, very, very quiet, uh, to get from the, all the overstimulation, uh, get into habits of, of self-reflection, um, you know, interrogate yourself. Why are why do these things anger you so much? Because on a certain level, it's important to remember that these things aren't happening to you, whatever you're seeing. They're not happening to anyone you know. Um, and they're kind of not likely to happen to you. I don't want to overstate that too much. But for instance, if you're watching like three, uh, three hoodlums beating up some kid in the back of a 7-Eleven, I mean, that's probably not going to be you. Um, and, and, and what are you, what, what is it doing for you to imagine that that's your future? Uh, so yeah, something like prayer meditation. I mean, I'm kind of anti meditation just because of the gay Western, uh, co-opting of, of all of these Eastern techniques. I think they're very self-serving and kind of tainted by entrepreneurial capitalism and self aggrandizement and like corporate psychology. Um, but yeah. Those would be good things to do too. Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly something strong about that. It's because when you're you're on the internet so much, you're essentially living in this rule of the abstract, where you're living in this digital space, where you're both seeing, you're both getting a certain hopelessness that comes from seeing what's all around you, and then that's mixed with the idea that it also could never happen to you. Like you get a bit of both. It's like a simulation, but it's also something that's actually holding you back from recognizing that you do also have agency in the real world it makes you feel really hopeless when you're constantly seeing these things happen right and i think getting outside that digital space and you know going out meditation like um like uh what josh was talking about it, it does help you connect well actually i prefer prayer you know but it does help you connect with the kind of way in which um you're essentially getting down to more a primordial realm of what it means to be human when the kind of distinction between past, present, and future starts to collapse, right? You have a connection with your own source of being, and then you're able to realize, you know, I maybe being plugged into some kind of digital quantification of mankind is just completely not healthy for me. And there's a lot more to us and who we are than that. And you let you know, God transforms you. That's what they say. Prayer transforms you. It's God's on a cosmic buddy button, right? And I would also think you got to learn, get together with your friends and learn how to feel alive because you don't feel very alive when you're always constantly plugged in online. So do some martial arts training, get punched in the face a few times. You know, you, you start to feel alive again because you don't feel very alive when you're in the, <laughs> when you're just existing in this digital space. You feel like you have no agency. You don't feel very human at all. You're eating shitty processed foods. You gotta, you gotta step up, and you got to be willing to try to learn to live. And it, you know, feels great to do that. So be both a prayer, pray, praying man, but also be a warrior man. So to do those things, right? And I, I can't advocate boxing enough. Uh, it's it's fantastic. I mean, I've, I've had a couple of concussions, so maybe I wouldn't advocate it too strongly. <laughs> do it safely, uh, and not in some fucking schmo's garage. But um, yeah, the there's, I don't remember who said this. Uh, it was back in my pseudo Buddhist phase many, many years ago. But there's a famous Zen master who said, you know, like the best meditation is sleep. Uh, and there's just, just as a way of thinking about like anything is meditation. Anything that you lose yourself in, um, that you kind of get uh, um, out of bounds with time, is meditation. So it's not like you, you light some candles and, uh, you put on Enya and you have your little yoga pants and you sit in a dark room. It's anything. It's uh, practicing. Right now I'm, I'm running Bure by Bach. It's very, very meditative because there's just so many parts of the brain that turn off. You can, you know, you're focusing very intensely on one thing. So in this Coco Beware saying deadlifting, look, when you're trying to move 400 pounds, there's only one thing you can think about moving 400 pounds. Uh, so yeah. All right. Next question. I think this will be the last one for now. I think what we should do is because there's quite a lot of them coming in is that we'll have to schedule another one of these and get to everyone else's questions. If the audience is okay with that, if you guys are okay with that, <laughs> we're going to be here for quite a long time if we keep going. So you want to do a democratic here, just make a decision. All right. I'll, 
be the sovereign, I guess. So this will be the last question from Corbeck for five. Do you think that movement must have an esoteric or spiritual core? For example, I believe that the German movement began as a group of initiates known as Thule. Must a group of elites be established first before material political organization? I'm sorry, what was that question? Something about esoteric? What? <laughs> Do you think the movement must have an esoteric or spiritual core? Must a group of elites be established first before material political organization? Yes. <laughs> you want to take that, Nils? Um, being somewhat of an agnostic myself, I, I don't think that I'm uh, the right person to, uh, yeah, to to judge this completely. Um, I personally, I believe that, uh, or to to the extent of what I've read about it, that the uh, is that the importance of the Thule Society um, for the build up and the the genesis of the ideology of uh, certain past political movements in Germany uh, are kind of overstated because people always tend to um, build a myth around esoteric and and, uh, and uh, reclusive societies. But personally, I believe that these societies where they existed or where they do still exist, like the Freemasons, which uh, pretty much have gone into being a, a, a charity organization to a large extent by now, um, have been kind of mirror images of the societies they existed in, especially in, in, the, in the mass societies of the 20th century. And I believe nowadays in our societies, which are to a large degree uh, fragmented and atomized and where social life continually um, um, uploaded into the cyberspace, uh, quite literally, um, these reclusive and secret societies with uh, an esoteric uh, framework uh, of one kind or the other are somewhat outdated. Personally, I would not uh, look up to uh, some organization of, of this Thule Society or Freemasons ilk, but uh, that may just be me. Uh, I guess Tyler is uh, way more into both uh, esotericism and uh, and 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 uh, such organizations. No offense, of course. Well, I mean, I think they're pretty cool, really. <laughs> no, I don't like Freemasons, but I'm saying like the idea of like elite secret society. You have an esoteric dimension, then you have an ex exoteric dimension that you put out for, you know, the wider audience. And I mean, I think that's generally the truth of most politics, really. I mean, because like, what are you doing? When, you, when you're, you're trying to develop a political movement that's going to have, you know, answer the questions of the day better than the other ones. And you're also trying to have a political movement that deals with everybody's normal life. It gives them a life that they want, that they can have families. It, it deals with things and they're very pressing, needing concerns that you have to appeal to. So you're always going to have an exoteric dimension, but you also have to have an esoteric dimension because trying to actually work out the questions of how you're going to do this requires a lot of intellectual energy across different sectors of kind of thinkers, you know, philosophers, economists, psychologists, all these kinds of things, uh, religious movements, you know, spirituality, things like that. Um, like, yeah, I think it's a pretty much a necessity. You always have a need for the vanguard, right? And that would be my answer on that. What do you think, Josh? Yes. Also, it's just pretty cool to be in a secret society. We'll yeah, that's that's the main problem, isn't it? Everybody wants to be in the in-group, but nobody wants to be outside and do the the hard labor and and to tend to the crops and stuff like that, while the other ones are sitting in their tent and uh, smoking funny stuff and 
envisioning the new political order and maybe i just yeah <laughs> that's the funny stuff of course yeah maybe maybe i just uh, got that wrong and uh stressed the religious or or spiritual dimension too much of course it always needs to have uh, it, there always needs to be a core group determining the 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 foundations of the political and societal order and uh yeah, the, the, the inner party and the outer party or whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah, that's 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 kind of a large question. Uh, anything else would be yeah, just just basic democratic and thus uh, the the politics of the end hive. Yeah, that's why we don't have to worry about everybody wishing they could be in a secret society because it's a secret, so they don't know the society, right? It's esoteric thamsterism. And I do also want to clarify that I, when I say spiritual or religious, I don't want to make it sound like some gay new age thing. Like I know what I'm talking, like I said earlier about like meditation and realizing being, I'm talking about phenomenological points about consciousness. I'm not talking about some lame Deepak Chopra thing, but I think because a lot of hijackers in the new age take these terms without knowing what the fuck they mean, it kind of can make it sound like I'm advocating that, but just to be clear, I'm not. Okay. Um, so you're not trying to push Russell Brand in the audience? Is that what you're saying? No. Well, we I, I've been promising this for so long is to do the theological episode, the spiritual episode, all these kinds of things, and more episodes on phenomenology, which we will get to, which explains this next question here right before Nils heads off from Harold for 10. I've heard Bishop Robert Barron describe phenomenologists like Diedrich von Hildebrand as late Thomas. What are your thoughts on a possible connection between Aquinas and Husserl? Now, I know Aquinas was more of a compound dualist, but in terms of particular connections between Husserl and Aquinas, I'd have to read more Aquinas, actually, in this regard, because my, my main readings of Aquinas was in a political theory class ages ago. And I know, you know, the Soma Theologia, there's all kinds of great information there. And I did read a little bit more of him in uh, historical theology, but... I think I would have to do a little more reading into Aquinas when he specifically talks about issues of consciousness, right? I've seen him come up with regards to topics like intentionality and things like that. But I will say though, we are actually doing, me and Josh, we're remaking that intro to Husserl's phenomenology that we did. So I saw a few people in the chat wondering uh, when is uh, more topic about phenomenology and phenomenological studies in particular gonna come back. We are remaking that series. And I'm also going to put out some solo videos dealing with things like time consciousness and perception and neuroscience from a phenomenological perspective. Those will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So you can look forward to that. Uh, did you want to head off, Nils? There's one question left. Is it the question of uh, what metal bands we were listening to? Well, that's a question from the chat, but if you want to answer that, you might. <laughs> nah. Okay, let's let's just do it, and I will head off then. Okay. You want to take the first jump? No, I thought you were. Are we doing the real question or the fake question? I thought you would read the actual question. A metal band? No, the the question no, the one... I to read out before I made that joke. That obviously. Oh, I thought you were actually going to answer it. I was like, well, this could be kind of fun, but we'll we'll do uh, EBM. We'll do Euro Bureau of Metal coming up, but uh. All right, where to go from Happy Mass Hill, man. What does third position say about democracy? Do we want it in a different form than what we have in the West currently or throw it out altogether? Hmm, good question. Uh, I'm probably not qualified to answer it. Uh, no, no, no personal experience I've ever had with democracy ever worked out, whether it was a rehearsal space, a classroom, uh, the therapist's office, uh, going to the DMV. Like, I, I can't think of any a relationship <laughs> with a woman. I can't think of any uh, situation where democracy actually worked out. I mean, again, when we talked about the myths of revolution, we did, uh, in those two episodes, we did talk about how some of the mid-century fascist movements kind of rhetorically or strategically uh, employed democratic 
uh, ends, whether they claim that they were uh, or they actually were, uh, is kind of you know a, something to be taken on a case by case scenario. Um, here's 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 the thing. For democracy to work would assume a very high level of social sophistication, a hot, very high level of uh, integrity and trust, and a very sophisticated population. Um, so if there is some like Gene Roddenberry Star Trek future where it's possible, well, then we're talking about like five centuries from now, four centuries from now. Uh, I don't see that happening now. What about you, Nils? Um, I believe for democracy to work, it is necessary to have a very small community. That's what most people tend to forget when they talk about Athens or the the Hellenic city states as the the the, the born of democracy, because those were very small communities, those were feudal communities. Um, only men were allowed to handle politics and women were treated as furniture. And uh, I believe this is not uh, what those uh, what those boilerplate Democrats would want to write on their play cards. But anyway, um, I believe in all uh, historical more or less third positionist movements, uh, there was there was a, a more or less common approach to democracy, and that was pretty much in in line with what uh, Max Weber called the authoritarian uh, leader democracy. Um, many of you guys may be uh, familiar with the term Führerprinzip, uh, especially from, from uh, National Socialist Germany, where one single person in, 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 in every area, uh, in, in every smaller group that works together and stuff like that, one has to be the leader, one has to be responsible, and the others uh, can, uh, can, can um, discuss uh, what needs to be done and stuff like that. But in the end, one person who is usually assigned before uh, hand needs to make the decision and if the decision is right everything's good and if the decision is wrong he uh, is no longer the leader after that and um, this this uh, this this whole system kind of breaks down the political uh, system of democracy into smaller fragments um, the the large decisions are made in uh, on a on a state level by the government, by the the uh, authoritarian leader, or a, a king, or a, a a duce, or a fuhrer, or what have you, and uh, his cabinet, and uh, from there decisions trickle down so that everything works out, and on a very fundamental level, and maybe the next two or three higher levels on let's say on on a on a uh, on a town community level, then on a uh, uh, a municipal level, and then on a maybe even on a federal state level, um, there has to there 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 is a certain democracy allowed. Um, back in back in the in the nineteen thirties in Germany, the ideal for this kind of system was the old Germanic uh, Ting, where the 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 men of a of a germanic tribe that were allowed to carry weapons the free men would uh, gather i believe once a month or so uh, underneath a tree and settle uh, all the scores and uh, discuss the problems that uh, would have built up in between two meetings and 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 uh, rule all uh, all arguments out and stuff like that uh, this this was the the ideal of democracy that uh, the people back then wanted to uh, wanted to reintegrate in their modern society. So um, nowadays, when we see some sort of uh, liquid democracy that some people aim uh, at, and uh, on the other hand, have more or less uh, uh, economic oligarchy tendencies in just about all Western countries. I don't even know if it is 
necessary anymore to have a uh, implicit standing on uh, on democracy because democracy in and of itself has kind of become an an empty signifier or or a meme in and of itself so everyone everyone uses the term everyone understands something completely different than all the other people uh when this term is used and so it's 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 just uh something that you bring up when you want to uh to to um tell uh an audience that your uh that your opponent in a discussion is some sort of uh, evil authoritarian and stuff like that and because i personally uh, have no problem with authoritarians do not really care about that yeah that was really well said and good history on how they conceived of it in the past as well i mean it's interesting if you read something like you know mosley's tomorrow we live and he talks about democracy in such a sense where you still have some notion of will the people, but what you have is instead of having multiple parties, you have it so there's one party, the fascist party, so you don't have these competing parties trying to deal with certain financial interests and gain power that way, right? And so then you have this notion where you have these sort of different guilds, right, that are part of different segments of society, and then the elect leaders who speak on their behalf, and that joins as a part of the fascist party, and then that plays a role in regards to the leader, and so this party could overturn the, the decision of the leader so that leader be overstepping their boundaries or something like that. So you still do have notions of democracy, but like as definitely what Nils was saying though, is that democracy is really much an anti-signifier or a meme these days. Like it's something that you contrast with any other system to say anything else other than democracy is gonna be some terrible totalitarian tyranny, right? It's just used as a way to get you to think that there's no other possible arrangement for the system that we could have. And I think that there is, right? And so it, it tends to be in some ways very loaded with all these different kinds of assumptions that we're thinking of democracy now, we're thinking about liberal democracy. And I don't think the ideal of having just everybody vote on everything regardless of like knowledge or skills or merit and things like that is a good idea. I think Mosley's idea of this guild, this guild system basically, I think is an appealing one at least within my context of, you know, Canadian Anglicanism, right? We do kind of, it would be a better fit for us, but I'm pretty sure in some other culture, there'd be a different fit for them. All right, now that's the last question. So over two hours, we are done. It always tends to be a little longer if uh, I'm involved, it seems. Yeah, because you talk very cold and disinterested German. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's not a bad thing. It's a compliment. Yeah, that's mean, what we like about you. Right. Yeah, responsible for the downfall memes here. <laughs> well, it's glad to have you here, Nolan. and glad to have you on board of EBL crew. Now there's four, us three and our friend Jefferson, who is still sick, so please pray that he gets better. And yes, find us on Library as well, not just YouTube. Tomorrow will be the return of Expanser Group. Um, next week, our episode will be with Alex McNabb. We'll be talking about Michelle Foucault's The Birth of Biopolitics. So we will see you guys later. Thanks for your questions. Take care. Go out and get punched in the face. Take up boxing. You'll yeah. Be